Welcome to the Friday, January 8th edition of the Clemson Dubcast. Hope everybody out there doing well. No more football, which is a very weird and abrupt feeling, but Clemson basketball coming through. Really interesting story developing uh, with this basketball team this year, which goes to North Carolina on Saturday. We promise to accelerate our coverage at TigerIllustrated.com of the basketball team, proportional to how well they're doing and how much more interest they're drawing. Title sponsor of the Dubcast since the very beginning, back in August of 2018, Parm Smith and Argent Law Firm in downtown Greenville. They want you to know that their office remains open and available to serve you during the COVID-19 crisis. They are also offering their clients the ability to meet via telephone or through video conferencing. Whether you have a loved one who has suffered from a car accident, defective product, a neglectful nursing home facility, or medical malpractice issue, Parm Smith and Argent Hold's Greenville lawyers can provide the protection and guidance you need. Free consultations, 864-99 or on the web at parhamlaw.com. That's P-A-R-H-A-M law.com. Football season is grilling season, and Jack Oliver's Pool, Spa, and Patio is South Carolina's premier source for the big three names in grills, Weber, Traeger, and my favorite, the Big Green Egg. Make the most of your stay-at-home tailgate party with a premium gas charcoal or pellet grill from Jack Oliver's. Their 10,000-square-foot showroom offers a huge selection of grills, patio furniture, and hot tubs and saunas. Shop in the store or buy online at Jack Oliver's Pool, Spa, and Patio. 3303 Forest Drive in Columbia and jackoliverpools.com. If you're in the Eastern Midlands and PD area and you're in any way interested in buying and selling a home, commercial property, land, need to consider reaching out to Uptown Realty. They're based out of Sumter and run by a friend of mine, Patrick Enzer, big Clemson guy, used to cover the Tigers in a newspaper capacity, longtime supporter of Tiger Illustrated, longtime listener to the Dubcast. The home buying process should be an enjoyable experience, so let Patrick and his staff do all the heavy lifting. All you got to do is pick up the phone and call 803 774 0435 or go to UptownRealtySC.com. Okay, our first interview today, Dustin Limlin, documentarian and relative of DJ Uwe Ungalale. Some really cool stuff, uh, background in DJ's commitment and the filming of it, and then a current documentary on DJ's senior season at Bosco High School in California. All right, here we go. Enjoy. All right, joined by Dustin Limlin, uh, who... Called me out of the blue uh, a few weeks ago um, to talk about the the DJ Uwe Angolale uh, story and also the fantastic uh, documentary uh, that that you put together uh, that has run uh, several times in the last week or so. I guess how you doing, man? Hey, Larry. Hey, I'm doing really well. Thanks for having me on. Happy New Year. Yeah, likewise. Um, really fascinating stuff. It's called Into the Spotlight. The journey through DJ uh, senior year uh, at at Bosco High School, and um, you are his mother Tasha's cousin. Is that right? Did I get that right? Yeah. So actually, I it's funny. Before this call, I was like, you know what? I gotta get this work. What is the actual real? So he's yeah. DJ is actually my second cousin. So Tasha, who I grew up with, is that would actually be my second cousin once removed. So our grandmas. Me and DJ's grandmas were sis- were sisters. Okay, so that's the that's the connection there. So you, we always call I always call him, you know, my cousin. But I guess technically he's my second cousin. So that's the connection there. Okay, and are you are you live in Southern California as well? Yeah. Yep. So uh, I'm in Southern California. I'm in uh, North County, San Diego. But we run our uh, production company out of Los Angeles. That's technically, I guess, where we're based. Where our offices and where a lot of our work comes from but we're also all over the place so um i grew up in the central valley and grew up really close with uh dj's family his grandma tasha everyone actually the south of uh fresno uh up in the valley so so yeah just just grew up with that family and just just had a blast and it's been just a wild ride watching everything that's been happening over the last few years all right your first (laughs) your first sort of inclination that this dj kid you know well first of all how old are you if you don't mind me asking yeah i'm 31 okay so, so i'm actually yeah right between dj and tasha so i'm, I'm pro- probably a little closer to tasha and dave's age but i'm kind of right in between okay so i mean obviously he, there's no secret that he was a, a child prodigy 
um, uh, you know, excelling at a very young age and being really, really big at a very young age. And so I'm just wondering what your earliest recollections are um, from from watching him and saying, wow, this, this kid's just uh, different. Yeah, well, you know, obviously my mom and Tasha are pretty close. And uh, the thing that I remember, because they grew up in Southern California, I was still in Central Valley, but lived really close to DJ's grandma. So we hung out with uh, Judy and everyone, but what, probably what I remember the most of, uh, you know, besides kind of growing up playing ball with Big Dave and everything, and see, you know, when he'd come and, and crush my family uh, and pick up basketball games, <laughs> and I mean, that's a whole hilarious story in itself. But what I remember is my mom would, you know, is before I think I message and text messages and all that, but she would get like an email, some like photos of of DJ and it'd be like, look how big he is. He's only three years old. <laughs> and I think that's like my first, like, I'm like, okay, this kid's probably going to be like a monster because here he is like, you know, I think, you know, before I think in junior high, probably like fifth, sixth grade, he was already taller than me and I'm six feet. So, uh, yeah, I think it was just those photos, uh, that I kept getting where I was like, look how tall he is. Look how tall he is. And yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of what I noticed. All right, and so you mentioned, uh, I have to ask, I have to follow up on, uh, you, you mentioned in that his dad used to come over and crush you in basketball. <laughs> oh, my gosh, yeah. So uh, in the Central Valley here, I went to a small private Christian school called Emanuel High School, and uh, my dad played, went on to play college basketball, and, and just in my whole Lemlin family, basketball is just a very prominent sport, and so you know, we had the keys to the gym. And so over breaks or reunions or whatever else, we'd kind of open up the gym to, to play basketball. And probably the thing that I remember the most, I have a, a uncle, his name's uncle Brent and he's a big man. He's, he's six, four, a solid, probably 250, 260 and athletic guy. He's, he's nobody, nobody pushes this guy around. And I just remember seeing big Dave come over and play against all my uncles and he was pushing around my uncle Brent like he was uh, a rag doll. Like he was, a, and my uncle Brent was getting fired up. But then D- Dave, here he is. You you know how big he is, is is throwing slam dunks on my uncle Brent, and I was just like, "Who is this guy?" Uh, so we were pretty. And meanwhile, he's like in flip flops while he's doing it. So. Yeah, it it uh, definitely left an impression, and so we always had our eyes on sort of DJ because it's like, man, if this is what Dave can do, like, what's what's DJ gonna what's DJ gonna be? Yeah, and then your uh, Tasha's side of the family has uh, some some very, I guess, high achieving athletic genes as well. I guess she said her uncle, uh, gosh, I forgot his name, played with the Falcons, still has the interception record, career interception record. Absolutely. Yeah. That's her, her uncle. And yeah, so that, that all happened over at Tabor college in Kansas. They had a football team, um, which, you know, just to get into the heritage heritage, that's, uh, yeah, just a, a small Mennonite, uh, private college out there. And so, you know, I always kind of laugh about DJ's, uh, Mennonite side, because you look at DJ, he doesn't necessarily look like your traditional, you know, Mennonite, but that's, that's sort of the, that's sort of the mix of, of heritage that I think is just awesome. I mean, I, I just remember, uh, you know, family reunions and Christmas and different things coming over. And then it's it was my, so one of DJ's uncles or, or Tasha's uncles is a, was a Mennonite uh, choir director. So we'd come and play piano. Big Dave would hop on the piano. We'd all sing and do the whole thing. And it just, just such a, such a rich uh, heritage of just not just sports, but arts and music. And yeah, it's just, it's uh, just a lot of fun memories as a kid. So it's exciting. So Dave has said himself that, he squandered his athletic gifts in high school uh, because he was a class clown, couldn't make the grades, couldn't couldn't stay eligible to play football and basketball, but he would provide halftime entertainment at the football and basketball games by doing 360 dunks in the gym and then by throwing the ball about as far as DJ throws it now. Do you have... Were you around during any of those times? Did you ever witness yeah, any of that so, personally? 
you know, it's funny. It's before like kind of the YouTube and rivals and 24 seven sports and, you know, huddle and all these different kind of rankings and ratings and all that. So it was all just, you know, kind of stories and hearsay, but obviously coming over and seeing what, what would happen on on my at my high school gym was a testament to his ability i do remember so uh you know as dj was young he he went off and played football and we were all super excited he was out in texas and doing that and i remember that uh we he he would have some game film and it's like literally on vhs tape right that was before all this digital stuff and um you know it was i think he was getting ready for any sort of higher recruiting and stuff and so it'd have like little circle and they pointed out and i just remember watching big dave and here he is he's it's not like he's 20 years old you know he's he's a little older to be going back to college uh and he is just smashing people throwing people around and i just thinking like this guy doesn't belong at a at a college like this he needs to be playing at a higher level so absolutely i i could testify and remember watching game film and, and almost every play he he's all over it so all right, so fast forwarding to uh, your venture with with doing the uh, doing the documentary, it's interesting because uh, DJ and and Tasha very private, or I guess very private relative to Dave, who is Mister Hype Man and who you know wants to take on all comers as far as promotion. Earlier in in DJ's career at Bosco. Um, as has I guess as we documented in 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 the one of the articles we wrote on DJ a couple of weeks ago, the QB one um uh, series the Netflix series was 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 documenting Bosco and 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 focusing in mainly on Real Mitchell the guy in front of him during DJ's sophomore year. Uh, Real ends up ends up uh underperforming and then loses the job is benched and then DJ takes over kind of a storybook um, turn in the narrative Netflix wants to shift all the focus to DJ which means uh, being embedded with him uh, everywhere he goes and then DJ and Tasha say no um, so that's the interesting part of your documentary is you you being uh, in the family were able to earn the uh, obviously have the trust um, to do it the right way. So I'm really curious to hear mm-hmm. more about the, the origin of it, like where, where yeah. and how it all began. Exactly. Well, I think we got to rewind to, so I, I had been filming DJ, you know, even before my formal production company, uh, kind of launched and started. And I, I didn't know what we'd ever use the footage for. I knew that it was a little more than, you know, like anybody can hand up run around with a handy cam and kind of get highlight footage and stuff. And, you know, as a production company, that's just not what we do. Uh, but I knew I was like, man, we're working on something. And then basically like the stars aligned when it was like, uh, DJ said, Hey, I want to do like a commitment video for, uh, committing to my college. And right then it clicked. It's like, wow, okay, yeah, we have to do something special. This is like a five-star guy. We got to give him a five-star commitment video. So I think it was like, um, I think I was talking to my dad, and he's like, you know what? With things like this, you don't really ask questions. You just go do it. And that's kind of what happened. So I took it to my team, and I remember thinking, yeah, because we're going to have to invest some resources into this. It's not just like show up with one guy and make it happen. But I took it to my team. Uh uh, Morgan Lott and Andrew Schundler and uh All right, when is I this? Was like, hey, oh, I'm sorry this to was in, Yeah, Friday February uh before he committed. What year would that be? Like twenty eighteen, I guess. So you already committed, right? Yeah. Yeah, so February twenty eighteen. So, you know, not a lot of time, but enough time. And I took it to them kind of thinking, I don't know, maybe they won't be into it and then they were just they were just all in. Uh as as they say, but from there, man, we we sat down. We went over to the, the young Willie's house and kind of sat down and just uh, and, and and Morgan kind of being our our director, master storyteller. Andrew's our producer, who just is able to pull strings and maximize and make the most out of what we had, which was a zero budget. And we kind of actually let DJ just share his thoughts and his 
ideas and he was like you know tj's just he's got so much more to him than just athleticism right he's 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 pretty deep his his relationship with his family especially his grandma um his his grandparents on dave's side and he's like i want to include all these aspects into my video not just like showing me throw a a ball and so we kind of if i had to describe it he gave us the ingredients and then we cooked the meal (laughs) it's sort of how it worked and so yeah, that's that's if if we had to say where this whole idea of making this documentary it really came out of the commitment video because if you followed that, I'm sure everybody saw it. I mean, it was it was everywhere. It got picked up by ESPN, Bleacher Report, Sports Illustrated. I mean, everybody was posting about it. I think in one day, two days, we got like 1.2 million hits on it um, on his own Twitter channel. So it, it was just a massive thing. And obviously all eyes were on him for his decision, right? But we just felt like the the cherry and the icing on the cake was to make something that didn't look like your average commitment video, but that looked like a something that should be on Netflix or a Nike commercial or something. So that was, that was kind of the idea mm-hmm. uh, with that. So, yeah, it, 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 that's and that in itself is such a funny story because it's like, okay, we can shoot all this stuff, and we had the idea uh, for to bring in this uh, spotlight. If you remember the commitment video, it's got this spotlight, and that ended up being the whole sort of uh, theme that we uh, riffed on for this the documentary, which is called Into the Spotlight, and it was so massive. It was this massive stage I used to work in. Um, kind of stage production. And so I knew this rental house cause they don't, it's not a TV film thing. It's a legit spotlight for live shows. And it was so big and we couldn't figure out how to get it up the stairs. And so big Dave put it on his back and hiked it all the way to the top of the, and we had to get it up this ladder uh, and he just put it on his back. So, I mean, not every shoot is, is sort of like as magical as this one came together, but it really came together. But really the, the biggest challenge and the, the big and audacious idea we had was like, how, how do we get to Clemson and how do we include Dabo in the commitment video, which I don't know. I haven't seen any other commitment video do that. So I don't know if you care to hear the story on that, but it's, it was, it was a pretty good story on how we, uh, how we were able to get out there to film that segment. Yes. Yeah, so one thing you broke up a, a tad when you said, did you said that you had to take the spotlight up the stairs? DJ? Uh, yeah, it you? was this giant, like hundred pound spotlight. This like the size of a bazooka. I mean, this thing is massive and we're trying to figure it out. There's no elevator to get up to the uh, bleachers, the top of the bleachers and, and the press. And so we're just trying to figure out how to do this. And we're like, okay, maybe we'll like two man, three man it. We're trying to figure this out. And Dave just says, uh, hey, don't worry about it. I got it. He just grabs it, puts it on his back, and marches it all the way to the top of the bleachers. And we're like, what? <laughs> um, he, he definitely worked up a little sweat by the time he got it up there. But uh, the end result is was obviously some pretty incredible footage that we were super excited about. Okay, so we said I said earlier uh, it was t- 2018. It's actually 2019. May of May of 19 wow. when he actually yeah, time committed. Flies. Yeah, yeah so, so that would have been February 2019, and then we filmed just a couple of days leading up to our trip to Clemson, which would have been in April, and then May 5th was the commitment date. Okay, so previous to to uh, the idea of of chronicling the commitment, you had you said you had been just periodically. Uh, just taking video of him over the years, like for a pretty long period of time? Yeah, I would show up and really, you know, it was kind of like, you know, I I wanted to do something, but then Dave too was like, man, you got to get out. You got to see this kid. So like I filmed a bunch of him in I think sixth grade, I went to a camp. I went to a Michigan camp in eighth grade. And, you know, it's kind of funny because I, at the time was working a corporate job, had access to a bunch of cameras that I brought out and, uh, Little did I know, I think Dave was kind of talking to different coaches' ears, and he was like, hey, that's ESPN. They're here for, for DJ. For DJ. <laughs> and so, you know, it's we talk about sort of the hype, right? And Dave's so good at sort of hyping uh, DJ that, you know, I'd come out there with cameras and I'd film some stuff. And, I, and I'm sitting on so much of this footage that didn't end up making the documentary. But, you know, shoot, maybe we'll be able to use it in the future. But, yeah, it was... It was it was pretty cool and pretty special to go out and kind of just show up 
and be a fly on the wall and kind of see how DJ plays. But then, you know, also got this archive of some, some pretty fun footage along the way. And so when I referenced uh, his sophomore year, when Netflix, when the Netflix cameras were all around, were you, were you interested in that? I mean, just being a film person. Uh, you, you... Oh, sure. Yeah, I think in some ways, I wish I I, I could have been the one yeah. doing it. But I think you know, for us, like he was following Real Mitchell. It wasn't following DJ, and obviously, it pivoted. Um, but you know, and that's the original question you asked. So how how do then we get from something? And I read your article. Seems like you know which 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 DJ. Tasha, the whole family, really pretty humble. Like, and then like, you know, obviously our documentary is about DJ. And I think the important thing is, is well, one, after the commitment video, he had a lot of, um, different opportunities and kind of shows approaching to kind of follow that, uh, senior year. You know, there was obviously QB one and there was some others, um, that didn't quite work out. And so we were kind of like, we just all sat together, together at, a dinner one night uh we went out and it was like hey what should we do with this and then we're kind of like well let's just make our own thing (laughs) was kind of the idea i mean we we obviously being the production company but like let's let's tell this story on on your terms and and that being you know for some of these other shows they want to be there every day every game every practice for us we wanted to be as least intrusive and for dj he wanted to make sure that the team didn't have this perception that that it was a film about him and all all eyes on him and that was really important to dj and it was important to us so when we had our footprint on campus and and if you if you watch the documentary it is it is about dj but it is about the whole team you know it's it's a football story it's about uh the road to the championship so but it just kind of speaks to dj's character he wanted to put his team first rather than a film project so there was a lot of things that we couldn't go to or we didn't we didn't do uh and and we weren't we weren't asking like please let us do this it was like no we were a part of sort of the team and we wanted to respect him as a you know he's a team player first right like in the documentary he says uh, it didn't matter to him if he was one or 1,000 in terms of the, the rankings uh, as an individual player. What what he cares about is wins and losses and championships. And so I think that that spoke a lot to his character uh, and, and uh, for us as a team to try and complement that as opposed to, you know, signing a bunch of stuff saying that the film crew is allowed to be at every single thing. So. Yeah, that's kind of how it happened, and it was it was an opportunity that we just couldn't pass up, and you know we limited it. We didn't shoot every game; we only shot a few games. We only shot a few practices. We we did go to Hawaii. We went to some different places, which was um, really cool and, and interesting. And in the end, uh, I'd probably say we we probably ran out of money. I mean, it took a lot of effort and resources to uh, film these games legitimate, like we did. I mean, we had uh, Ryan Augusto, one of our uh, uh, sound mixers, you know, Mike, Tom Brady and the Super Bowl and things like that. And we called in so many favors and we kind of just ran out of favors by the end. So I think, you know, we, we had enough to kind of cut together a whole series, but, uh, it was also exactly what DJ wanted, which was something that was a little more like low key and, uh, didn't intrude on his teammates, which I thought we did a good job at. So, and I'm bouncing around here. I apologize, but I definitely want to get back to the story of the trip to Clemson and the commitment video. So he had already been just to sort of set the stage for the listeners. Um, he had already been to Clemson the previous summer, and he had personally had been totally sold um, once he met Dabo and all that. And so, I, as I piece it back together, he wanted to get his mom to come with him to go on the visit just to sort of seal it. And I presume that that visit in April was when that's when all that went down, right? Yeah. Yeah. So he had already been to Clemson and I think in his heart of hearts, he had already made his decision, right? Like he, he wasn't, he wasn't, he still went on some of these other uh, trips. And I think, you know, pending like a a major God shift, uh, I think he was committed, but he had not verbally committed yet. Like a lot of these players do in secret and whatever else. So, so DJ actually hadn't committed, uh, yet. And that's correct. He did want his mom to come out. He wanted, uh, uh, one of his coaches to come out and, uh, obviously he wanted me to come out to help film, uh, 
uh, sort of this sort of segment that we really were like imagining what if we could get DJ in his pads in Death Valley, <laughs> basically shaking Davo's hand, saying he's all in, and it was just like that was the biggest what if, and how cool would that be? So, so yeah, that was it was a two twofold trip, you know. Obviously, I think he wanted to actually get out there to to verbally sort of, uh, um, well, I, yeah, I don't know. You you might have to cut this out. I don't know if they. Uh, is that a no, breach no. of NCAA? No, 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 no. That, that's he can verbally a, commit. Yeah, yeah. That's okay, been, cool. That's been established. Yeah, that's been told. Cool. Yeah. That's okay yeah. to be established. Yeah. yeah, so I think he wanted to be able to go out there in person to actually tell Davo, like, hey, I'm all in. I'm committed. And then, two, he wanted to bring his mom along uh, so she could see how special and amazing Clemson was. And, uh, and oh, my gosh, is it special and amazing. I mean, it's just a different... It's just the, the the air is different. The people are different. It's just that, you know, you can see why DJ really wanted to make that uh, commitment, uh, you know, in person, bringing his mom. So, yeah, that was kind of uh, how it went. So then that was the idea. But it's like, okay, how do we get like a film team out there, a small film team? And it was uh, just me and I had one kind of other guy we, we took some stills and stuff and his name's john mark ledoux and he's an east coast guy and so it just kind of worked out um but how do we tell clemson and that we need you know we, we need an extra extra meals and some extra clearance or whatever for two other guys so basically the story that we spun was oh you know, DJ, all his, all his visits, he brings a film crew. We're kind of documenting <laughs> the journey. And so, uh, you know, this is just sort of normal. This is his thing. This is what he's doing. And they went for it. So we had a blast actually working with, uh, compliance and trying to figure out what can we show? What can't we show all those sort of things? Um, and, and really, I mean, they just a top notch in terms of their recruitment, make sure everything's buttoned up because yeah, there's nothing, or actually wrong with us being there, but there are some, you know, they've got some proprietary things that they do. And, and even in their facility and different things that, you know, we couldn't show some of the, some of the secret sauce, if, if that makes sense. So in the end, uh, we made it out there and just, just had a blast, uh, kind of visiting the whole town. And this was, you know, an unofficial visit. Uh, but, uh, ultimately DJ was able to make that commitment there. And we, I mean, we got all of that on tape that you don't see that, on, uh, in, in the commitment video, but it was a pretty special trip to be on. So DJ went there knowing he was going to commit, but he wanted to surprise Dabo. He, that's correct. Yeah. I mean, I had a, I have a feeling that Dabo probably knew it. they had a good chance, but if, if he, he wasn't sure, uh, Dabo wasn't. Uh, so he was able to actually sort of make that commitment in front of his whole family. Um, coach Streeter was there and uh yeah it was it was just kind of a special time on the field there after the day of uh filming that uh yeah the dj was able to make that uh commitment so pretty pretty cool uh moment all right so whose idea was what if we could just do put dj in pads and then he can you know who, who came yeah, up with that yeah yeah so uh yeah morgan lot our our creative director and uh director he directs a a ton of stuff. I mean, we work with all sorts of brands and he's kind of the creative brains behind the operation. He kind of was like, Hey, you know, if you guys could do this, this would be awesome. And that, I mean, what you got to know is that segment in the pads on the field, like he had a jam packed day. He was supposed to, DJ was supposed to be doing academic facility, uh, touring and this paw journey and they, uh, all this stuff that they do through these recruitments. Cause it was, uh, the spring game. So they had a bunch of other recruits there. And so we kind of had to pull some strings to make this happen, but it was only about like a five to 10 minute window of that whole field segment that we actually had to do that. And we had to like essentially beg that we could make it happen. So it was, like I said, it was just me and one other guy. We got DJs uh, in pads. And if you see, there's this kind of scene in the locker room, he's putting the pads on and we got the little light, our cinematographer for all the, uh, the principal photography in LA, Sean Conte came up with some awesome ideas, just hanging this light above and turning everything out, making it super moody. And so it was just 
me and John Mark out there and we're like, how can we make this happen? And so we, we got him padded out. We got him on, onto the field and then we, I, I filmed kind of the handshake moment, which was awesome. That was just one take. And then he had to go off the field and his, you know, the, the, his team was like, okay, we got to go. We really got to go. And we hadn't even done any of the drone stuff. And I brought this big drone. It's an Inspire 2. It's this big, massive drone that I flew all the way out. And it's like, we need these drone shots. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I checked and they checked, you know, all the FAA clearance. Like, oh, we're good. We could do this. And then they're like, you, no, sorry, he's got to go. And then it was DJ who's like, let's just make it happen. So I popped the drone up and then like literally that was like one minute of flying. I pop it up, do a little circle on him and then pull it back and then bring it down. And then it ended up being like the most amazing footage in the whole thing. I mean, that's just how filmmaking goes. But it's also just a testament to DJ. He's just, he's just all in. He's like, no, let's do it. If we're going to do it, let's do it all the way. And uh, yeah, the result was, was pretty cool. So you mentioned that, you know, Clemson, let alone other schools, aren't, aren't used to recruits coming in with their own film crews. How did, uh, what was the personal sort of interaction with Dabo and others as, as, as DJ has this, this uh, I don't know, entourage, for lack of a better word, uh, with, with cameras and such? What was that yeah, like? Yeah, well, if you know Dabo, he, puts, he keeps a pretty tight lid on his program and, you know, even kind of, uh, which I respect an extreme amount, even like social media and how things. So, you know, he, uh, I actually, uh, it was later in the summer. Uh, there was the, uh, uh, what is it? The Clarkson quarterback retreat there in Santa Monica. And Trevor was actually one of the quarterbacks, like one of the coaches or whatever, like helping the other players. And uh, uh, I was hanging out and we were filming that. And it essentially spoke exactly to that. And Trevor was like, basically like, you'll see it's, it's, it's awesome. You'll get to Clemson, you, you know, you shut down the social media and the cameras and all this stuff. You'll see it's awesome. And so it, uh, you know, for Dabo to be open to it, I think, you know, DJ is a pretty special guy. So I think Dabo was willing to maybe accommodate a little bit. I, I he was the nicest guy to us. I mean, I got to like, do a little bit of bench press with him and you know uh i mean honestly just such a a a neat guy and he took the time to you know ask about my story and and all these things and just just a special guy and that's that's dabo anybody that's in the room he he makes them feel like they're important so he didn't give us any lip he just it was nothing but uh just just sort of accommodation all the whole the whole time Solero Communications, formerly known as Tandem Payment, is a full-service integrated electronic payments provider powered by leading-edge technology. Solero provides a wide array of merchant solutions, simplified payments. They make onboarding, taking payments, maintaining risk management and compliance, and getting support quick and easy. At Solero, they're all about helping you achieve sustainable growth as a business. Taking payments isn't the only thing your business needs. With Solero's solutions, you can manage inventory, sell products and services via social media, schedule staff, track sales, get reports, and much, much more. Find out more about Solero at solerocommerce.com. That's C-E-L-E-R-O commerce.com. Another loyal supporter of the Dubcast is Blackacre Law Firm in Greenville, a subsidiary of Parm Smith and Archenthal. Blackacre helps South Carolina residents achieve their dreams of home ownership by providing experienced, professional representation for real estate closings. Attention to detail is crucial in real estate law. Blackacre is committed to making sure nothing gets by them preparing residential or commercial closings. Blackacre also offers estate planning services for their clients in the Greenville area. Find out more about Blackacre at 864 Two six three five zero seven. So, put put me in your shoes uh, as you're leaving Clemson. You're flying back. Are you thinking, "Sweet, we've got everything we wanted. This is going to be great," or or is there just a natural? Uh, I, I think so, but not sure. You don't really know until you get back and start the production process. No, oh, that's exactly what it is. I mean, we, we went out there and we shot like a lot. Like we shot like we shot like a little scene of DJ being like on the river there. What's the what's the river? Uh, Lake Hartwell. Uh, yeah, Lake Hartwell and like a few different things. It's like how's this gonna kind of unfold and we we shot, you know, obviously interview stuff ahead of time and so it felt like it might be 
cool. Um, but you know, sometimes you, you feel like you have good footage and then like you watch the edit and then you're like, Hmm, I don't know. It's maybe it's missing something. Um, uh, kudos to Morgan who directed. He's also the editor. And, you know, I came back with the footage and basically the first cut, all of our jaws just dropped. And we were like, this is the most <laughs> insane thing. I mean, it just, if you watch it, right, it's short, it's, it's poignant and it's just, it just, it's just special. So, uh, we were kind of just over the moon excited about it, especially stringing on no budget. You know, these things take a lot to pull off and it's not just a guy with a camera, but like all the way from, you know, sound design to colorist to like all these different things to make it like special, like truly a five-star video. So yeah, that was, uh, uh, we, we had a feeling that it was probably going to hit pretty hard, but really all the stars aligned for this shoot, which is, which doesn't happen all the time. So <clears throat> the visit is in early April announce uh, commitment. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Commitment is, is in, uh, I guess, May 5th, uh, Tasha's birthday. How, how, how long did it take, um, you know, from when you get back until you, until you hit basically. Yeah. We basically only had like two weeks to put everything together because it had to be, you know, ready. And then like we had to send it to Clemson to make sure there wasn't anything in there that wasn't, you know, supposed to be, I mean, like I said, it's not like we did anything. It's just, you know, with, with, uh, NCAA and everything, like we just, you know, we want to make sure everything is good and everybody's good with, so we had to get it all approved ahead of time and colored and finished. So yeah, it was a pretty tight turnaround, probably like two weeks. Uh, but we were ready to go. And, uh, DJ was like, yep, May 5th, that's the date it has to be. That's my mom's birthday. And that's when we're launching it. So, and then, how tall was the task or how much effort was put into keeping it a secret, like among his, his inner DJ. Oh inner my gosh. Yeah. Well, I would say DJ is a mastermind with social media. Like he, he, he know, I mean, he, he grew up with it. Right. So he knows. So there's always like a little part of you that's like, Oh, should we not send it yet? Like, is he going to share? And it's like, of course he's not. It's his thing. And he's very locked in with that. Uh, but you know, with a guy like uh, Big Dave, you're like, man, I know he wants to post about this hype <laughs> so much because he's so good at it. But um, even he is so good at social media that, like, yeah, we shared it with the whole family, like, probably weeks ahead of time. And they were really good about I mean, honestly, they had, like, zero notes, which doesn't always happen. They were just like, yeah, love it. It's perfect. 10 out of 10, which was for us just such a great feeling and just like a fun collaborative process because you know we felt it, they were truly stoked on it we were stoked on it so it was just an amazing collaborative process did a bunch of people know like everybody is high school know or or, or or was it really a secret no because we kept it under lid so it was uh um it was uh chris his receiver right who was there who's at uh oregon state i'm blanking on his name now uh, they call him Quavo, <laughs> Chris, uh, oh, somebody's going to, okay. but he was, it was just, it was just one of his receivers and him and then his family. They, we kept it under lid, like all the footage, even the Clemson stuff, like nobody, I mean, obviously Dabo and Streeter, but even the Clemson team, like none of the other players knew that we were making a commitment video cause he hasn't committed yet. So, oh my gosh. Uh, yeah, we had to keep it pretty, pretty under wraps and, um, yeah, it was difficult because even knowing that he was committing to Clemson, not just the film, like that's the proprietary information that was just hard to, you know, keep a secret. <laughs> well, and then you are in a football stadium and there's a road that goes right over the hill that in a spring game weekend, I'm sure there are people just milling around. Although to the average person, it just looks like, you got oh no no we, we no no nobody really saw us as as camera people like especially for the spring game we didn't bring the big cameras into the spring we were just bystanders uh enjoying the football game no i'm saying so, i'm saying during the commitment the, the uh, on the field the not i guess the day no, before the spring game that was right was, was that where the commitment was where he where yeah he yeah okay i'm just saying yeah. like you could have had somebody who's just walking by mm -hmm. who sees you know, DJ in uniform and cameras, you know, you guys. No, are no, we, we tried to do that to where there was, there was like one guy with a network, like setting up a camera 
but we're like, ah, he might not know. But like seeing DJ in his uniform and everything else, like there wasn't anybody else in the stadium at the time. So we were trying to be pretty careful. And that's part of why we could only have like five, 10 minutes on the field or whatever. Okay. And so, so yeah, wow. That's, that's, uh, that's, that's really cool. Um, all right. And so now the, uh, the, the idea of, 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 following him around his his senior season and and doing the uh doing the the documentary that's out right now when when did did you come up with that idea after the commitment or totally after the commitment i don't know we should have like it's like we we should have like thought about this ahead of time because it's like oh my gosh we should have followed his whole junior year and senior year and everything but you know you, you can only do so much right so what what we did have was some opportunities some um, you know, like I said, there was other people trying to do things on him and it's like, well, we're here and, and we should do it. So it was, uh, uh, yeah, Morgan and Andrew on my team and we were like, let's get together. And, you know, this is before COVID obviously. So we all got together a big wall post-it notes and we just like kind of talked about all the themes, all the different things that we can talk about, uh, for a football story. And, and we actually developed out a whole kind of like series, uh, idea, uh, for the show and uh, ended up just started filming before we had any sort of like, where's this going? What are we going to do with it? Like, who knows? Let's just start filming. So that's because this, this was happening, you know, this is basically in August and his season is starting that month. And it's like, well, we got to film it. So we started just shooting and as the nature is with documentary filmmaking, you don't necessarily know where it's going to go. So we kind of started, uh, it's kind of like, you know, jump off a cliff and build the airplane on the way down was sort of the, how that ended up, uh, going down. So it's basically you, you come up with something and then, then you shop it to networks like, and in this case, Correct. Fox sports. Yeah. Yeah. So we actually did come up with a whole sort of uh series pitch and different things. And we did, um, you know, we're, we're a relatively new, uh, production company, um, haven't had anything sold directly to Netflix have worked on, you know, worked on things uh, on the production level, but not quite on the development front that, you know, we're at here, you know, all of us doing things that we haven't quite done before. Um, like DJ committing to a school or us, you know, trying to pitch a show. And so, you know, that's a whole story in itself of like, you know, a, a testament of where, and, and sometimes it's the ignorance that I think got us as far as it did. Cause it's like, if we knew how much work it went, what went into all this, if it's like, man, I don't know. Uh, but, uh, yeah, to be honest, we, tr- we, we tried to do a lot of different kind of pitches for different networks and outlets and different things, but it wasn't actually until we finished it because, you know, we didn't quite know what we were selling because we didn't quite know the full story that was going to unfold. We didn't know that St. John Bosco was going to beat modern day in the championship. Like that would have been a different story if they lost that game. It probably wouldn't (laughs) have been quite as uh, exciting. So after we made it and, you know, we, we kind of leaned into some of the Fox sports uh, footage, which is like, gosh, Fox would be such a great, home for this because it really showcases one of their players and makes their network look really good. And it's just, it would just be sort of, uh, the perfect, uh, end place for this. And so we ended up getting a hold of them and they're like, yeah, we'll pick it up. So, uh, they did. And that's kind of the, I mean, as I'm learning, that is the pretty typical process with how to get something made, right? Like it's, it's almost impossible to get anything made or picked up. That's, you know, of, any sort of network or streaming quality. And so for us, we're like, well, let's just make the thing and then see if we can find a place. And and we did. And it's, it's, it's been super exciting. Yeah. QB one wanted to make it about that senior year about DJ and Bryce young, the quarterback at modern day, as they went through the season, you know, toward their eventual expected showdown. Right. Correct. Yeah, they really did. And and we worked with QB1. Um, we shared some crew uh, for the game that they played, the first game. QB1 was at where Bosco actually lost to Modern Day. Uh, so that will, when the show comes out, I'm sure that will be in there. We released some footage and sound and different things for that. But, you know, for DJ, I think what he, what he was most concerned about, it was it was football first. And then, you know, he's an entrepreneur at heart. 
And although this isn't his venture, it's our venture. Like he, he, I know didn't want to ride on the coattails of, of something different. And, uh, he, he kind of, he, he wanted his team to be first and not a film crew to be first. If that makes sense. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, when you have a big corporation like Netflix, it's like, well, you can only say no so much, I guess. And when it's your second cousin who made your uh, commitment video, then he can be like, Hey Dustin, let's, let's not film here. <laughs> and it's, yeah. And it's, so yeah, it was kind of an interesting uh, thing, but yeah, just to go back to that whole idea of yeah, Netflix, he's got big opportunity to, you know, essentially like he took, he took a risk on, in, on us in some ways because it's like, yeah, it could be on Netflix and follow his senior year or we could do something different. So, you know, I'm obviously appreciative of that, of that but I also understand that it kind of was able to put him in, in, in more of the control position to not uh, worry about, uh, I th- it just goes back to the big thing, like what his teammates are thinking if somebody's got cameras in his face the whole time and how that's going to affect our team dynamic and, and potentially wins and losses. So it comes back to his competitive nature and what's going to help the team win, basically. Some of the folks I talked to, I guess mostly coaches over there at Bosco, said that um, DJ didn't like the way that Netflix portrayed um, the the quarterback battle in his sophomore year, back in his sophomore year, between him and Real Mitchell, because they're, he's like, that's my friend, you know, and they sort yep. of, in his mind, his interpretation was they pitted them against each other and kind of left a sour taste in his mouth and maybe other people's mouths as well. Do you have a, a, a good, a good feel for that? Is that pretty much? Yeah. I mean, Hey, come on as a filmmaker and storytellers, like we thrive off of drama, you know, in some, some shows lean more into that than others in the relationship and pitting against. And, you know, don't get me wrong. DJ's the most competitive guy on the field, but in the end that's, that's on the field, off the field. I mean, DJ trained with Bryce Young at the same training stars training academy. You know, they're their teammates. I mean what what you don't see is in the uh in the documentary there's a scene with uh Adoree Jackson and Paul Richardson, both in the NFL. Paul's with the uh Washington football team and Adoree, I think he just got traded actually. He was with the Titans. He was a, I think he was first round. Um so in that scene, Bryce is also there and they're training together and they, they go up and then they, um, they talk, uh, they do the whiteboard and they talk plays and they talk and they, meanwhile, this is right before the big season where they're pitting against each other to try and win the championship. So I think with something that you see with these kind of elite athletes is they kind of stay away from that, that drama. And, uh, they understand like, Hey, you know, we're blessed to be playing at a high level. Like we are in high school, the best football programs in the country. And it's just, it's just a testament to sort of the mental strength to kind of go beyond the surface level. Like, Ooh, it's me versus you and all this thing that, you know, they're very cordial and actually can help each other. Now don't get me wrong. When they get pads on, it's, it's all, it's, it's, it's all business. But, uh, I think off the field is, is, is where you see, they want to see each other succeed, which I think is extremely cool. Yeah, there, there's two sides to, uh, like the 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 Real Mitchell story really illuminated the the the, the drawbacks to um, to you know having an 18 year old on, on a on a major platform um, with all this celebrity being followed by Netflix. But if it goes bad then man you just feel for it's just not a good look you know not a good look for his dad his dad was kind of showing his ass a little Mm -hmm. bit and then then you could tell it really just he sort of crumbled um mentally um probably and i'm just this is just from the outside looking in probably from the pressure that from the cameras and also from the pressure of the super talented kid behind him and so it's like man i don't know if i would want yeah uh, that to happen to my and what you got to know is it's not just DJ that wasn't necessarily excited about QE1. I mean, Bosco saw that too in the coaches and, and the administration there. So I'll say this. We we had a case to make to try and even essentially get access because I think, I think after that, I think they had said, we'll never have a film crew here again. 
And so we knew we were kind of up against that. And it's like, okay, well, how can we, how can we smooth this over to say what we're going to do is different? You know, let us film your games. We'll be, you know, and so they were, they were, they were pretty like restrictive in the beginning. They're like the first game they're like, you can only have three cameras. And by the last game, I think we had like seven, you know? So it's about trust and comfort. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of stories to be told in, in football, but you know, ultimately you want, you want the right person telling your story, I guess. Can you give us a sense of just how big those games are? between Bosco yeah. and, and, and modern day. Like I did not have a sense of it until I started diving into this story and watching a lot of the, a lot of the old videos and stuff. And it really comes out on your, uh, on your document documentary. Oh, yeah. It feels like college. I mean, it really does, which maybe explains it is. why I mean, it's, it's bigger than some colleges. I mean, it maybe explains why DJ was so comfortable uh, against Boston college and Notre Dame this year, you know, um, being thrust into the starting roles cause he had been, Oh, through. no question. Yeah, you have a lot of players, right, that get sort of, you know, starstruck or whatever else once they hit the big the big field. I mean, personally, I, I had no doubt that DJ was going to be fine on that level. And part of that is because of how big this high school football is in Southern California specifically. I mean, there's a reason some of the biggest names have come out of Southern California. I, I played high school football whole whole community kind of came out and it was you know whatever a big deal for that but when you go and you see these games you know first game of the year uh you know you got a, a team you've got img you've got all these teams flying all over the halfway across the country to play a game uh you, you know this isn't just normal football so i mean probably the biggest thing for me that i sort of had this realization was filming that championship game and somebody, somebody said a stat that 21 of the guys on either side of the team, right? So modern day and Bosco combined, 21 of them were going to D1 schools. Wow. And once you start to realize that's, that's like enough to be, you know, both, both sides of the team that are playing D1. Like, so you're basically watching D1 football, right? And there's a lot of other good football that's not d1 right so these are d1 guys competing and i mean yeah it's a testament to the programs that they built in southern california it's a combination of i guess the the money the competition and just you know the sheer amount of uh uh people we have down here but i mean it starts at at the youth level i mean that's the crazy thing i mean dave took me to one of the uh sort of pop Warner leagues. And I just remember it was like this dark foggy night and like the way these coaches were talking to the kids, not like in a negative way, but in like a serious tone, you would think that they were a college team. It's how serious that, that they take it. And like, sure. It might be like, I might think it's a little overboard. I'm like, guys, it's just football, but like these kids take it serious. And then if, if they stay hungry, then they take it to the next level and then they take it to the next level and then they take it to the next level. So, you know, the poise of DJ being able to jump into a game like Boston College and Notre Dame, you know, obviously comes from that. But it also comes from he's just a special kind of person. Like I've met a few people. I, I came from entertainment and the stage and different things. And there's people that get like really nervous before they get on stage and have this whole I'm, I'm per personally one of those guys. Right. I got to get into a mindset and all this thing. Um, and then there's other guys that just are cool and level headed kind of no matter what's going on. And <laughs> DJ is one of those guys, which is kind of a freak show because you got a guy who's got the athletic ability, but like the mental poise and calmness that, you know, I, I think I heard a couple of guys saying, uh, after the Notre Dame game that they're, they were kind of the ones freaking out. And DJ was like, no, like we're cool. <laughs> and, you know, to come in as a true freshman and be able to say that, or, you know, at, Boston college when he said, yeah, it's, it's whatever it was, three scores, four scores. That's not, that many points and when you see in our documentary in the final uh kind of seeing the the championship game they're they're down about three four scores at half and then you know you you end up well you guess you're gonna have to figure out watch the game and see how it goes watch the documentary and see how it goes out but um yeah i think it's a combination of things but certainly these giant programs in southern california are uh, a huge testament to uh 
how to get kids ready for being on the bigger stage. Yeah, I wrote about him yesterday, just after Trevor Lawrence made it official and he's leaving. So now it's sort of officially, you know, DJ's team. next man up. Yeah, and so I was, it occurred to me, I'm thinking of those two games against Boston College and Notre Dame, and I'm thinking, okay, what was his biggest mistake in those two games? And I'm having to rack my brain. Like, I mean, I'm thinking, okay, he took a sack at the end, you know, toward the end against Notre Dame, maybe when he should have thrown it out of bounds, or oh, hey, maybe he missed this throw slightly. And but there's no usually for a freshman who's thrust into that kind of there's some glaring setting. It's like mistakes, oh, he threw yeah. that pick in the end zone, you know, or something that you remember. The fact that you have to rack your brain to think of his biggest mistake is it, it pretty much says it all. Yeah. No, I mean, obviously, I think. Uh, Clemson's in good hands. It's kind of one of those just wait, you'll see kind of a things. But, you know, I'm a little biased, obviously, but getting to hang out with him for his whole senior year and kind of filming the process and, uh, you know, from from not just like on the football field, but like off the football field, like what what you don't know about uh, DJ is that he's just such a low key guy off the field. Uh, but he's the hardest worker. Like, you know, we'd come over and he's like having breakfast and he's literally watching film and like dragging Mateo to like, say, Hey, look at this, look at that. Because, you know, Mateo came up for playoffs and ha- had a chance to play a little bit. And so, and that wasn't for the camera. That wasn't for anything. He's just, he's just watching film. And if he's not doing that, he's playing video games and he's going to be like, He's going to try to be the most competitive at video games. I mean, when we were on the when we were on the recruitment trip, uh, they have a practice facility, and I think DJ was testing like how bad do these guys want me because we stayed in that facility until like two in the morning. They have like a little golf setup simulator. They've got the little basketball. They've got pool, billiards, ping pong, and D- you name it. DJ's jumping from like little game to game and just trying to beat whoever's in front of them. So it's kind of like, you know, kind of like that Michael Jordan mentality a little bit, like how he didn't matter what it was, like he wanted to be competitive at it, but also just having an extreme amount of fun. It's not like an angry competitive, just like, it's just fun. So yeah, it's, uh, it was quite the journey following him through that whole process. So you've painted the picture of, of just how huge high school football is. Uh, in Southern California, not just high school football, but all the training and you know going all the way down to Pop Warner, just how important it is. And yet, you have DJ at Clemson, you have Bryce Young at Alabama, JT Daniels, who also played at Modern Day. Yeah, he's at Georgia. At Georgia. Now. How yeah. hard is it, and how uh, frustrating is it? How much do people sort of? I guess, gnash their teeth over there at this exodus. Not all the players leave, but I'm just saying, like, I mean, you could legitimately have next year, um, you know, two, you know, a Bosco quarterback and a, and a modern day quarterback in the national championship and they're playing in the Southeast. So yeah. what, what is that like? And how, how, what do you, you just, I guess you just chalk it up to the PAC 12 needs to get its crap together. Yeah. I think they do need to get their crap together. That's for sure. Um, I grew up, in the Fresno area, right? So Fresno State, so watching both the Carr brothers, uh, you know, I think in 2021 here that you, that you have those same guys. I don't think that they stay in the Pac-12, you know. So uh, it's interesting because of maybe technology. I think it's probably the best the best way to think about it in recruiting and like how that's essentially rewinded the process and, and broken down the barriers of communication. I mean, you should – you know, the story of like how DJ, you know, what's the number one thing that, that a quarterback wants going to a program? Well, one, they want people they can throw the ball to receivers and two, they want an offensive line. So the group text and Instagram messages and whatever else that they got going to essentially recruit each other, but, you know, sort of DJ being at the helm of a lot of that is fascinating. And so because communication has sort of the barriers of community have gotten easier. I mean, truly kids can go anywhere now because, you know, it's, it's about who they're talking to, who they want to play with. So, I mean, in terms of Pac-12, you know, Oregon is still huge out here 
in Southern California, they, I feel like they're, they're at everything trying to get people to come out. But, you know, yeah, you see programs like USC and I mean, yeah, it's not, it's not a good look that JT Daniel starts there and then ends up at Georgia, but, and then look how well he's playing there. Mm-hmm. Right. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's two, it's twofold. You know, I, I think it's, it's one, we just have truly some of the best talent and, and going back to, uh, being ready for the big stage. They know that kids that come out of modern day, out of Bosco, out of some of these different Southern California schools are going to be ready for the big stage. Right. So that's one. And for two, it's Pac-12 just hasn't had a, a, a good look or like, I don't have, they even been to the playoffs. Like, I don't think that they have any team. So Oregon, uh, went in, in 2014, the first year of the playoff. That's right. And I think that's the only one. So, you know, if you want to be the best, you know, go to the best schools. So, and I think that's the biggest thing is that is recruiting too, right? So think about these kids that get a chance to go visit these schools. Um, I mean, I, I remember talking to DJ and Mateo when they got back from LSU and their eyes were like, <laughs> they, their jaws dropped. They're like, they're like, Dustin, I didn't realize how big football was out there and so you know i think if you're serious about football which people are here you go to the serious programs like Mm -hmm. alabama clemson lsu you know and we just unfortunately it doesn't feel like the pac-12 is taking football as serious yeah you can't fake the bigness correct yeah you really can so how many hours ballpark of, of footage did you have total uh, oh, you... we got hundreds of hours, literally. We, we have, I mean, game footage. I mean, there's games we shot with seven cameras that aren't in our documentary, <laughs> which is in some ways sad, right? Because you go to all this effort. But uh, uh, Andrew and Morgan, both who directed this piece, uh, just did a fascinating job at, at kind of pulling the story together and the, the beats that are important and how do you make a piece that is actually like fun and exciting rather than just like a day in the life. I mean, we shot so many scenes that... I mean, uh, so like we've got this scene that I, it's going to get used somewhere. Somewhere we're going to put together something, but it's, it's DJ going to get fitted for that suit. And I don't know if you see, it's like this, uh, oh, what do you call it? It's like a, not a pinstripe, but it's got the sort of X's lines through it. Anyways, he's, he's worn it. He, I think he's got like tweeted a little bit about it and stuff uh, a few times, but I think he wore it to the Notre Dame game. Yes. Yeah, you're right. All yep. business. That suit, we filmed the whole process of him getting fitted for it, and it's just like this European guy, and it's just like a really fun scene that it didn't have a place in in this. But I, you know, I, I uh, between you and me, I, th- I I think that there's going to be some opportunities to continue to tell DJ's story. So I, I think that at some point we'll be able to see that. That's fantastic. What's the most? I mean, you already knew the guy, of course, but what's the most interesting? thing that you saw uh behind the scenes that you that you walked away going wow i didn't know that or you know wow that's really interesting yeah i think it's two things i think it's one like like dj really cares about the people around him and like you know it's to be a quarterback you can't just have talent right and you see that right you see that um in uh, on on the highest level in the NFL right now. And it's like guys that maybe seem like they're a little more concerned with themselves than others. Like, I think the reason that DJ makes such a good quarterback is he truly makes everybody around him better. And that's not just on the field. It's off the field. Like if you're hanging out with him, he's going to look you in the eye. He's going to ask you how you're doing. He's going to hear your story and, and then maybe give you something that, that, that makes you, and it sounds crazy because he's 18 years old or 19 years old now. But I think that that's what does make him different. And, you know, between his life experiences and, and just sort of the position that he's been thrown into, he's kind of just stepped into that sort of leader role. So I think when you hang out with him, it's just, you know, he's just a fun guy. Like, like I said, hanging out till two in the morning in the practice facility at Clemson, you know, it doesn't matter that I'm not as athletic as him. If we're playing a game together, he's going to, you know, have fun and compete with you. And I think that's, that's the cool thing. And that's what makes him probably special as a, as a quarterback is that like, 
he understands the team dynamic and that like everybody in the room is important. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. All right. So you you sent me the uh, schedule of uh, the broadcast schedule. Um, and I'm looking at it, and it looks like a bunch of Fox, like West, Fox. Uh, yeah, Fox Sports West, Fox Sports Prime Ticket. Yeah, it's it's kind of been um, been. So they just got acquired by Sinclair, so a lot of their stuff is is transitioning out. But it still is on Fox Sports West, which is available for most people with DirecTV. So I know a lot of people back east who have been able to kind of tune in. It's channel six hundred ninety three, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, six ninety three on Directv, uh, six ninety two for Fox Sports West. So if you have Directv, that's going to be the best option to watch it on this um, broadcast run. But we also uh, are just signed a couple deals, so we're launching with uh, Players TV, and which is a TV channel. It's exclusive to Samsung uh, devices and TVs, but uh, it's uh, it's sort of like Samsung Plus, I think is the name of their TV platform. But it's called Players TV, and that's will be this Saturday, the 9th, at 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern. And then we just finished a deal with uh, Whistle TV, which is a huge platform um, and available all sorts of places like Roku. It's on Amazon, all sorts of things. So I don't have the dates yet for Whistle. But that's going to probably be the most accessible way to watch it. Is you know almost anybody has an Amazon account or a uh, or a Roku or something like that. So once that's there, it'll be available on demand. So probably in the next couple of weeks. Wonderful. Absolutely. Well, Dustin Lemlin, thank you so much for your time, and this has been a uh, this has been a great conversation. Really appreciate it. Hey, absolutely. Thanks for having me on, and uh, you know, hopefully we'll. Uh, We'll we'll keep it going. I think Clemson's uh, got a got a bright year ahead of them with uh, DJ, and you know uh, here he is walking, uh, not to be cheesy, but into the spotlight. Harris flooring has been a major part of the facilities enhancements over at Clemson, not just with athletics, but also at the university level. And we are thrilled that they are a part of the Dubcast as a sponsor since 1947. The Junkins family and Harris Flooring have provided a unique shopping experience through value in their services, developing the right product solutions, and delivering on their promises. To check out some reviews on their work, just go to their Facebook page, Harris Flooring America. Rave reviews, just first class all the way. Phone number 864-642-6183. Happy to have Founders Federal Credit Union on board as a sponsor with us. If you've been to a sporting event in Clemson, you've probably heard about Founders already. They are the official credit union partner partner of the Clemson Tigers. In addition to that, all Clemson faculty, staff, and students are eligible for membership as well as IPTA members. Matt Gross is a proud Clemson alum and the vice president for the Clemson market for Founders Federal Credit Union. Matt's office is located beside the Walmart neighborhood market on Old Greenville Highway in Clemson. For more information, go to foundersfcu.com. Okay, now we turn to some excerpts from our interview a few weeks ago with Stephen Lowe, the offensive coordinator at Bosco High School. Audio is a little glitchy just because we recorded it in a bit of a different uh, format than our normal podcast routine, so bear with us on that. But still, some really good stuff. Uh, anecdotes from Stephen Lowe and his relationship with uh, with DJ. Here we go. Uh, yeah, he broke my hand. <laughs> he broke my hand as a uh, junior. <laughs> All right, I have to recreate this. Can you tell me, can you, can you tell me like the setting of, 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 of how it happened? Uh, we were doing like sprint out passes for the day and just like, uh, I was kind of catching for everybody. And, you know, typically that's, that's, that's been a common practice for me to, to go out there and just catch for guys. It's just easier for me to do that and let them continue to just, you know, get reps. And he threw it out to <laughs> P-Rod. I mean, that's probably about like 20, 25 yards away. And I mean, this, this, this ball was like literally, it didn't rise or fall one inch. I mean, that's how, that's how hard he threw it. And uh, there, there's some times where he would, he would release the ball so hard and um, put so much velocity behind it, it would kind of come out with a little bit of, like, kind of a fishtail. So the nose would kind of be going up and down just a little bit. But, like, you know, he's got so much strength and velocity on the ball. It's still traveling through the air at, like, you know, probably I mean, footballs are out probably in mid-60s to low-70s. And uh, I just happened to catch it wrong and it ended up hitting the – uh, in the palm, like where my thumb and, and, and kind of like the uh, like the inside, like pad of my my, my palm is, and it ended up bending my whole like uh, not not the thumb, but actually bent the base of my thumb back. Like 
Like the pad under the thumb. The, the pad under the thumb. <laughs> so, I mean, <laughs> the thing ballooned up to about the size of a baseball within like five minutes. I mean, it was ginormous. But, uh, I mean, the, the thing was like, like a scud missile coming in. Yeah, that, that was uh, that was fun, and I vowed never to catch one ever again. That was, <laughs> I know the quartermaster catch me, but I've done catch. Me, uh, so I never. I don't think I caught a ball from him after that. That was that was my uh, my tenure was done. <laughs> uh, Dabo Sweeney, I guess it was a couple of months ago. Um, one of us reporters asked him about his arm strength, and he said it was when it really. Uh, when it really dawned on him was during a camp when DJ was there oh, yeah. and oh, DJ yeah. was just throwing to like these little kids who weren't even yeah. really visiting prospects and Dabo had to intervene and, and, and get the get him out of there because he was afraid somebody yeah. was going to get hurt. I mean, we, we had to do the same thing in our practices. I mean, there, there's, you know, we have a wide range of, of skill sets and stuff and, and kids that are like, you know, obviously kids are going power five schools guys are getting offered and then we have kids that are just around for the high school experience they want to be a part of something cool so even for us we had to kind of do the same thing and and move kids around it's just you can i you know i, I can i can envision in my head you know a ball hitting a, a you know a young light receiver and watching the receiver get carried away or taken away by the football into into space or i don't know where but I mean, we, we I literally it was it was always a concern for us for that same for that same reason. He's gonna get somebody hurt. What, what's your uh, I guess just your general um, take on on DJ? Just as a not just a player, but as a person, just having worked closely with him. Uh, the stuff that makes DJ special isn't the football accolades or the skill set or any of that stuff, and, and that's already. I mean, that, that's been, you know, spoken on and, and written about and seen already. I mean, just um, just his, his personality, who he is as a person, how he treats other people is really what makes him special. And I think that's why Clemson was such a – it was such a, 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 an easy fit. I mean, the, the culture and what they have there, I mean, it, it fit exactly who he was as a person and what he was looking for out of a college. I mean, he's the type of, he's the type of person that will literally – you know, if you let him, he will literally sign every little kid's autograph and shake every every person's hand and, and get to know them a little bit with general interest. I mean, you know, you see you see kids that I mean, at the high school level, would line the fences to basically get you know to touch his hand or, or to say hi to him or whatever. He would legitimately ask questions like, "Hey, where are you from? What are you playing football at? What are you, you know, what, who's your favorite player?" Like, legitimately ask questions and and. and show genuine interest just because he wanted to be, you know, that person that he had experienced as, as a kid. And, and, I mean, he, he spoke on, on times that he met some of, you know, his sports heroes and how impactful that was for him. And, you know, he wanted to do the same for the next generation, just, just stuff like that. I mean, stuff that you wouldn't see necessarily, you know, on camera or, or anything like that. But if you watch him operate, you know, even when no one's watching, I mean, it's genuine. I mean, he really is that type of person. He's a... Uh, Somebody that I think multiplies the people around him. Like people want to play harder for him because he's a good person, and you know he's obviously got the skill set and all that stuff. I mean, he has those things that that people gravitate towards, those leadership qualities, and you know that that's what I think stands out to me the most about him as a person. I mean, if he was getting offers in sixth or seventh grade, I mean that that can that can go awry really quickly, and you know unless you got a, a really really grounded home life and and a very, very deliberate approach to to humble your, your own son and, and to keep him grounded and to keep him focused on the correct things. I mean, that, that can go really, really bad, really sour, really quickly. I mean, you've seen a lot of examples of just, you know, that whole experience going south for a lot of people. But, I mean, none of that stuff has ever affected him. He's never cared about any of that stuff. I mean, he's, he's always just been grounded on, you know, on, you know, the fact that he needs to be a good teammate and, and, and a good, you know, sibling and a good, you know, family member, a good student, community member. I mean, really, that, that's kind of been his focus and his emphasis. I mean, even on game days and stuff, camera crews and stuff are following him, and people are jamming cameras in his face during warm-ups, and none of the stuff flops. You know, he's unflappable when it comes to that stuff because none of that stuff is relevant to him. Like, it, it doesn't matter because he's got a deeper purpose and deeper meaning to 
who he is. He's a family person. I mean, he's a mama's boy when it comes down to it. I mean, he would do literally anything for his mama. But um, family's number one. I mean, you know, you know, religion and and, and, and God is, is is definitely a high priority for him, and, and he's very very aware of who he is and who he who he wants to be as a person. So it's very very refreshing to see that, even as a young, I mean, as a 16 year old, 17 year old, to see that out of him in high school, of how clear his direction and his purpose in life was. So so you're so you're sort of parachuting in to this. Yeah. He's already a celebrity. Yeah. Um, and he's obviously a just a out of this world talent. I mean, that's an interesting story just by itself. Like, what what was that like for you? And and when did you when did it first dawn on you? Um, well, I, I knew I knew who was going to be the quarterback going into uh, to taking that job. I mean, Boss was a, a premier job in the nation, and um, yeah, I was from Northern California, about about three hundred fifty miles away up north in the state. But you know, being in the same state, you, you know what's going down in Southern California, and you, you know the landscape of football down there. So, I mean, I've I heard about him as a fifth grader. I, I think I saw like a clip of him going like I think high eighties, low nineties, and you know, launching a football. I think like at, at sixth or seventh grade, he was already throwing like. 65, 70 plus or something like that. It's something unreal. Um, so I knew kind of like going into it that he was going to be incredible talent. And he was actually the first player I met after one of my interviews uh, on campus. And that's when I was like, wow, this is going to be special. Because when I met him and I kind of figured out what he was all about and his general demeanor and kind of got to talk to him a little bit more, uh, that's when I knew I was walking into something. I was walking into basically a, a gold mine. I mean, it was going to be, it was going to be as far as we wanted to go because the type of person he was and, and, and the talent level and all that stuff. It was just going to. I knew it was going to lead to a championship season at some point in time in his career. So you knew the talent, but then meeting him, you saw what was between the ears. Is that? Oh yeah. I mean, definitely. Yeah, you know, when you meet him, you talk to him real quick. You, you, you just get a, a really a, a sense of just um, humility, a grounded humility is what you really you, you get from talking to him immediately. Like it's always um, it's always about others. It's always about you know you. He always he always asks you know so you, most high school kids aren't asking about you know other people's backgrounds. They're, they're kind of you know waiting for sometimes their turn to talk sometimes. But I mean he is generally interested in, in who you are and wants to get to know you and. And we had a pleasant conversation the first time I met him. I think we sat down and talked for about an hour before I had to take off. But, um, you know, after that, after that, that interaction, I was like, wow, this kid's different. He's different in a good way. Did you know you had an offer at that point? Or you were trying to figure out whether to take it or not? Or how, how did that go? Uh, no, at that point, um, I kind of gone through, like, the initial interviews and I had an idea, at least I was in the running, but um, wasn't sure if it was finalized yet. I was still kind of in the, um, kind of in that that whole the whole paperwork interview. Had to meet some more people process, but um, so when I met him, I was like, man, I sure hope I get this gig. <laughs> I mean, literally, I was like this coach in America. Landing that job and 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 you know coming down here and and getting to you know having DJ as your first quarterback. I mean. At that point, it's just like, <laughs> do I even have to coach? I mean, this kid just really gets on the bus, and that's the my, my extent of my coaching. <laughs> is DJ on the bus? All right, I'm good for today. We're, we're going to be ready to roll. So that, that's how, I mean, you, you, you basically help you help him along, you guide him along, but the amount of coaching that you do is, is, is a lot more minimal than the average kid you're coaching. I mean, the stuff that we're working on is, is definitely not what the average high school kid is working on, so... I was definitely very, very fortunate when, when I got the call and I, I heard I got the job. <laughs> so while people like on it, on this side of the country didn't start hearing about him until he was like a junior in the state of California, people who like football people had had been hearing about him since way like fifth, sixth grade. Yeah, uh, I'd say because he, he, he had a couple of big news stories that were like. I mean, I mean, he was doing some unreal things. He was ginormous already as like a sixth grader. I mean, by the time he was a like a seventh or eighth grader, he looked like a like a junior senior. And I mean, in high school, I mean, most of the games that I mean, we played a lot of out of state of opponents um, in his junior and senior campaign. And uh, like the common thing would be like, I knew he was big, but 
I didn't know he was that big. <laughs> or like they would say, I thought it was a tight end coming out, or I thought it was a DN coming out. <laughs> you know, it was like, you know, he, he nothing prepares you for, you know, his stature and kind of when he comes out, uh, you know, of the locker room and you know, he's got his gear on. It's like, holy smokes, this guy's legitimately six five and two fifty. <laughs> this is uh, it's impressive. So, um, I read that that uh, your offensive system there sort of hybrid of NFL West Coast with a spread and RPO and that you guys studied Clemson a good bit and modeled um, some of your stuff after that. Can you can you um, enlighten me on, on, on the background there? Yeah, so, I mean, I've studied spread offenses for a while, and that's kind of like the base of, of what we do. And, you know, Clemson's always been, you know, one of the, the biggest producers of, of offense production and championships. So, you know, I've we, we always try to study the best and try to emulate what they do and, and, and take their ideas and apply it to what works for us. So, I mean, being able to take, you know, being a, a college prep program and wanting to prepare ourselves for, you know, our, our players for the next level, you know, we, we, we do take every effort we can to try to learn from next level uh, of, of the game and apply a lot of those principles to what we do. And um, with the skill set our guys have, it, it makes total sense that, you know, a lot of our guys can make those type of throws, and you know, with DJ, he, he can literally do it all. I mean, if we want, if if I wanted to run him more, I could have, but literally, I, I don't think I could have stomached the 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 loss of him if, if we were to give him an unnecessary hit. But his skill set can do you know whatever you ask for. I mean, literally, if, if you want to throw play action deep, if you want to throw great game, if you want to throw sideline to sideline, if you want to run the football with him, I mean, there's nothing that an offensive system is going to ask for him that he can't accomplish or can't do. So, I mean, for us not to implement that would be, would be unwise. So, I mean, we, we've been basically hybriding, you know, and, and grabbing kind of stuff from different systems and, and then forming it into our own, our own little weapon based off of, you know, the skill set of the guys that we had around him too as well. And I mean, it definitely worked out and the ability for him to stretch the football down the field and open, open all those lanes up is really where we started from because that, that's his, his biggest skill set. And the thing he loves to do the most is, is to drop those deep balls and to spread the field vertically and, and to stretch the field vertically. And from there, we, you know, we branched off into having a diverse run game that we're able to read basically multiple defenders on, on the field depending on you know the structure for the week. And he was able to handle all that stuff. I mean, he set protections for us and redirected protections based off of um, secondary coverages and um, any type of like roll-up blitzes that he would see. So I mean, he was doing stuff that he's he was not being asked of now. So I mean, for him to mentally handle that as a high school kid is, is just a testament to just his preparation, his hard work, and, and just how bright of a kid he is. Just um, very, very unflappable. I mean, the game moves. He processes the, the game a lot faster than the average high school kid. What were they running before you got there? Was it was it significantly different? Very okay. Very very similar. So I mean, they, they were they were a vertical passing team with spread RPO concepts and um, very high level football. So I mean, he was very very prepared even before I got there. So I mean, going into it, um, the previous coordinator did a really good job of preparing him, and and you know even his freshman freshman year had his freshman offense looked like a varsity offense for most teams that run the spread. And, and for him, for you know, to ask a freshman to do some of the things he's doing, you know, it, it's it's not very common. You get you know a fourteen year old kid out there and be able to get to multiple progressions in a read and deliver the balls where he needs to deliver it. And, and that's just um, that's just, that's just the the culture and, and what we have at Bosco and the guys we have surrounding him also are, are, are allowing him to do some of the things he's able to do because you know it, you need an equally excellent athlete on the other end to catch a ball from him as, as you can see from, from my left hand <laughs> not everybody can do that so I mean it's just the, the, the system and everything we have in place is just it's set up for everyone to succeed here so we're very very fortunate for that in that regard now when you say you know in ninth grade he's doing these really complex things can you put that into like layman's terms just so that average person like what are those defining or distinguishing examples i guess of of what you see when you say wow most you know most high school kids aren't doing this or that 
So, you know, for instance, um, you know, for reads and progressions, like, um, you know, a lot, a lot of high school based offenses are like, you're going to read one defender and, and you're going to, you're going to pick and choose between the two routes that are surrounding him. And basically if you can't get that, tuck it and run. <laughs> it's like, it, it, you try to, you try to make things as simple as possible because kids really can't. When a, when a typical freshman kid walks up into his first year of football, he's not able to get off that one and two. And, and you kind of see younger quarterbacks stare at receivers or predetermine who's going to be open and, and just force a ball into windows that aren't there. And, um, you know, if you notice here throughout his whole entire career, uh, he doesn't throw very many interceptions. Like, he does not throw very many picks. He's very, very calculated and makes really, really great decisions and takes a lot of pride and take care of the football. And um, that comes from, you know, the amount of film study he does and, and how fast he can process the game and get off of, you know, first and secondary reads and get it to, you know, where, where there's basically open grass and, and, and matchups. So, you know, the typical high school kid's not doing that. You're, you're not seeing a kid, you know, reset to his third, his third progression in, in, in the play and get it to that person and drop the ball in, 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 the, in the window that, you know, he's provided sometimes, which is not very big, you know, when we're playing against, you know, defenses of the calipers that we see on a week-to-week basis in our schedule, I mean, there's four- and five-star recruits littered across the field. I mean, we play modern day, and, you know, they send 15-plus guys out every single year to Division One schools, and that's what he's facing, on, 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 you know, in a championship atmosphere, and, and he's still throwing for 400-plus yards versus them. So that's not a normal thing for high school kids. No, normal high school kids are going to have to run the football and, you're going to throw some, some easy, high-percentage passes and things that are really, really lower on the difficulty scale, just in, in the distance and, the, and the, the level of difficulty on the throws. Um, he's able to throw, especially in the high school game, it's actually harder to throw a sideline throw to the, to the field side than it is in the NFL even because the NFL hashes are, are really, really close together. So there's never really a, a far sideline throw. But um, you know he's able to hit field throws, like field comebacks and field outs, things that most quarterbacks wouldn't dare to throw because the amount of time that the ball spends in the air. So that's another level of, of things that he can do physically that most kids can't do. I mean, the I think I don't know if you've ever heard of the, the recruiting story you have with Texas, but Texas came to watch him throw. And um, after two balls that he threw, they, they were like, Coach, we've seen enough. We're good. He threw a, um, he threw a field side 10-yard out so in the air, a field out from the opposite hash spends about like 30-something yards in the air. And he literally hit it without the ball rising or dropping at all, which typically when the average high school quarterback throws, that ball is going to kind of loop up and it kind of drop and teardrop down there, whereas his ball is like a frozen rope. <laughs> and then he threw a post ball, and they were like, all right, we've seen enough, we're good. So that, that's kind of the skill set and some of the things he can do physically and then the, the read and processing and then – uh, that's kind of the, the second layer that the average high school quarterback is not not doing. Even even the the above average, the, the recruitable quarterbacks, some of them aren't doing. You know, some some colleges, you know, some some quarterbacks get to that college level, and it, it's a learning curve because they haven't been asked to do some of the things that they're going to be asked to do on a college level offense, or you know, some teams are running you know NFL concepts at, at the college level. So that, that that's the biggest separation. Yeah, it seems like most of even. Freshman college players is like half field reads and stuff. Yeah. Whereas that, I mean, he was able to progress through. I mean, one through five in a lot of in a lot of our concepts and and basically be able to pre snap looks and then be able to see things as he's dropping back and be able to progress through faster. So that that's kind of the in the layman's terms how I would, I would probably best describe that. Do you think the level of competition that you referenced and then his extraordinary sort of mental capacity is what made him so comfortable against Boston College and Notre Dame? Oh, no doubt. I mean, he, he's, he, I mean, if you take a look at our our championship game alone, I mean, there's probably, I think every defensive back he went against in the modern day game and our section championship game went power five or is going to go power five this year. So, uh, let's see. One corner is offered by basically everybody, everybody in America. Uh, the other corner is going to Oregon. Uh, the safety is going to go where the safety went to. Where did that safety go? I'm trying to think, but I mean, literally, it was like two LSU commits. You know, 
an Oregon commit. Uh, I mean, every single DB out there is, is offered and, and, and going to go to somewhere big. So the speed at, at what you have to process – you know, in some of our games, it's it, it definitely is. It's not college football, obviously, because you know, that's a faster level. But it makes the the jump a little bit more manageable, especially just going against our defense. You know, in practice every single day, and, and we signed in his class. I think we signed seventeen guys or eighteen guys out of his senior class. You know, and I think ten of them were defensive players. So wow. just going against those guys on a on a daily basis, you have to you have to process quickly, and you have to have a plan. You have to be able to identify and, and, and set protections properly and identify, you know, when pressure's coming, what coverage you're getting, and then be able to apply that back to the play that we have called. You have to be able to do that at our, at our level, even just in, in practice and spring ball and summer, because if you don't, you're, you're going to struggle, and you're going to struggle mightily. So that, that the, the speed and, and, and the level of things that you have to process from an early age in, in high school is just definitely, definitely aids in, in – you know, him being able to adjust to the college game a little bit quicker. I mean, it seems pretty obvious he's like a Cam Newton type runner with the speed and athleticism. Is the reason you guys didn't run him a lot is just because you didn't want to get him hurt? I mean, I think you said that earlier. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. That was definitely uh, that was definitely. A, I mean, it, if he would have got hurt, it, it basically would have been our, our shot at the title and all that stuff down. So, I mean. We, we made we made it a priority to make his health and his well being our, our top priority. I think the most stressed person on our team was off its line coach every single week. <laughs> he's, uh, he's the person that he's got to protect the president, you know. He's, uh, <laughs> and uh, he's got to run next to that car and, and get out in front. So off its line coach, I think it was uh, he, he was the only person I think that was semi ecstatic that DJ was leaving because he didn't have to <laughs> to protect the uh, you know. The president anymore. <laughs> wow. I mean, Clemson's going to run him once he's totally healthy. Like, he's going to be a dual, dual threat weapon. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, he's definitely a, he's definitely a pocket passer. I mean, he's definitely something that, that will shred you in the pocket. But, you know, his, his athletic ability and what he can do there. I mean, after a season every single year, we would typically have a week or two off before finals would kind of wrap up. And um, instead of lifting our guys, we'd let our guys play basketball and do that kind of stuff. And just watching him run up and down the court was like, oh my gosh, this kid, this kid played varsity basketball as a freshman, and he's still like get up there and like three sixty dunk, and he's got like range. I mean, he's, he's like bombing threes, and I mean, he's just a phenomenal athlete. And he goes picks up a baseball and launches a baseball ninety plus miles an hour and gets a ball out of the park. And I mean, I think we we're playing like cornhole one time, and he like smoked. <laughs> he smoked it. Like, like, what can't you do? <laughs> I was talking to Danny Hernandez earlier. You know him, I guess? Oh, yeah. Um, and I asked him what the most impressive throw he saw in those two games, the Boston College and Notre Dame games. Was. What, what, what was the most impressive one that, in, in your eyes? Uh, there was one where he was um, scrambling right, had to push back and get depth, and still had to hit a, a moving target coming back down the sideline and, and just absolutely drill it. So, I mean, that, that's the, the ability to throw off platform on the run is not something that is easy. I mean, you're literally trying to hit a moving target while you're moving and trying to sync up exactly where your body is and then where that ball needs to go and you have to process that information of who's open. And you're also running for your life, too, as well. So, I mean, the, the, the majority of people would crumble in that situation. I mean, the, there, there's college quarterbacks that would crumble in that situation. For him to make that throw and not think twice about like, oh, yeah, that's what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> that's his attitude, too. It's like, well, I mean, that's, that's what I'm supposed to do. So it's, is it special? Is it supposed to be special? <laughs> like, did I do something good? <laughs> so that, that's, that, that was, I think that was the most impressive assault uh, from him during that two-game stint. Was that Notre Dame? I think it was Notre Dame. So it's, it's funny you say that because Danny mentioned a very similar throw, except I think this one was he was running to his right, but he threw the guy was it was like an over route, and it was it was to, it, it wasn't on the sideline. It was over the middle, but it was definitely across his body. Is that the same? I think thing? you're right. I think you're right on that one. <laughs> yeah, I think same right thing he mentioned. Yeah, that that is not easy. That, that, yeah, that's a very 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 hard throw. <laughs> yeah. And he and he was saying it was like um, they had worked on his footwork for those precise throws. Like if his if his back foot wouldn't have been Planned the right way, it would not have. Yeah. 
if it's not turned in, his hips aren't getting around, and um, he's basically cutting his lower half off, and he's he's sailing that ball or dropping it into the ground most likely. So that, that that's that's mechanically what would go wrong if he, he doesn't have his, his his right foot set properly. Because with the right foot set properly, now your hips are facing in towards the throw, and you can actually use your your lower half, and then now you line up your throw better, and then you're dropping it down. Um, and 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 Danny was saying that. Like DJ is not your typical. He wasn't your typical kid who specialized in one thing from you know no, from when he was in you know five years no. old, and no. that the the that play there was. I mean, it's almost like a a second baseman turning a double play. You know, um, where like he 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 his premise is that you know that's a baseball type move, and that and that his his multi sport. Participation is actually um, really beneficial. Do you see that too? You see what I'm getting at? Yeah, definitely. I, I would, I would agree with that wholeheartedly. I, I think. Uh, I mean, I don't, I don't even think football was his favorite sport. I think until his junior in high school. So, I mean, he, he, baseball is his first love, and you know, he played hoops and done a, a bunch of other sports. You know, growing up. So that just that cross training and the things that he he done in other fields and courts is just you could definitely see that stuff carry over. And that's what makes people natural athletes, the fact that they've done a bunch of different things and haven't specialized early. And partially what, the reason why he stayed so healthy. I mean, he's never had any major injuries outside of, like, you know, that, that shoulder thing, to, you know, a couple weeks ago. But, you know, he stayed healthy because his body's kind of always fresh. I mean, he would just roll from one season of sport to the next, and he would train hard in the offseason in the weight room and do the things he would need to do health-wise to make sure his body was ready to play. And, and that, that's that's paramount, I think, still, and I think we're losing that as a as kids are starting to over specialize from an early age, and you know, play four seasons of baseball, and you know, play football and seven on seven year round. I, I still don't think that's the necessary way to go. You know, especially quarterbacks, you need those guys. You take a look at the amount of guys that play baseball and other sports. You know, in the NFL, it's you know a large majority of them. Like functional strength, it gives you, I guess. Yeah. yeah. No doubt. I, I can't zero in on w- exactly when and why he he decided football only um, because it, it seemed like they read a bunch of articles. At one point, it was like he's like, "Yeah, I want to play both," and then all of a sudden, it was, "No, I'm not." Did yeah. you have any insight into that? Um, I, I I remember a couple of moments. Um, I still remember. Um, I think it was after his. Junior, halfway through the season, we played modern day uh, in the regular season, and um, just that that environment is pretty special. It's like twenty thousand people in the stands, and I mean, it, it's it's a game that's hyped up in Southern California for literally the whole season. And um, I remember him talking um, after, and it's like that feeling doesn't exist in baseball. Like that that's a special feeling you can't recreate, and it's definitely not happening on the baseball field where it's like. You know, there's 20 people on the, in the stands at, at a baseball game. You're chewing seeds and just kind of hanging out. <laughs> you know, the next play goes, you know, gets hit out to the outfield. And, oh, you might pitch, so that might be kind of, you know, cool for that day. So that was kind of the first time he kind of talked about um, the shift and kind of the love of, um, you know, football over over baseball a little bit more. Um, and then after, I think, going to Clemson experience and the football experience, that, that was uh, – just going through the, the tour and, and seeing the facilities, meeting the coaches, and getting getting kind of a like a grasp of, of what that life was going to be like. Um, I think that definitely changed his perspective a little bit more and realized that like I've got to, I've literally got to be all in. <laughs> yeah, I've got to give everything I got to, to this to this sport right now and prepare prepare myself. I mean, I think the, the reason why he did so well in, in those two games that he started in was you know he, he prepared himself as a as a starter the whole year. And, and, you know, that was his mindset going into it, you know, knowing that, you know, Trevor's the guy, but, like, at any point in time, it's, it, my number can be called. And, you know, I, I don't think he ever treated the football side of it like it was going to be a redshirt year or a year that was going to be a clipboard year for him. I mean, that's not how he operates. So, I mean, th- those are kind of the, the first kind of two times that he really talked about football kind of being his number one. So the the – the magnitude of big time football is really. Uh, he gravitates towards. He gravitates towards competition. I mean, just the his, 
kids that like to win and there's kids that like to compete. And um, he's not afraid to compete. That, that, that's a thing that he's proven from a, from a young age. I mean, before I got there his sophomore year, he was um, basically walking into a situation where there's a quarterback that was there that was, um, you know, a state champion the year before. Mitchell. Didn't, yep, didn't, didn't hesitate to, you know, some kids would transfer in those situations. Some kids would, you know, try to, try to do some stuff on the side to try to, you know, increase his chances of playing. But I mean, he didn't care. He just put his head down and worked and ended up being the guy. And I mean, same thing. He, some quarterbacks would not go to Clemson to go sit behind Trevor Lawrence for two years or a year or whatever it may be. You know, he, he saw that as an opportunity to basically go in there and I'm going to go in there and compete against the best and make myself the best I can be and learn everything I can learn from a, a guy that's probably, you know, an all-time great at, at, at Clemson. You didn't come with him on any of his visits, did you? Uh, I didn't, no. I actually came on, um, we went, uh, I think a month before he committed, we, we actually went out there for um, it was just a staff visit. So we, we ended up going to Georgia and then spending, uh, I three days at Clemson and uh, met with their staff and got to sit on their meetings and watch practice and everything. And when I got back, I was like, man, I can see why he probably want to commit there. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, can I come out? <laughs> Say it again. I'm sorry, you broke up. Oh, I, I said basically uh, after we came back from that visit, um, yeah, I said, hey, I think I might commit with you. <laughs> <laughs> I totally get it. I was like, uh, you know, all those lakes and stuff, and seeing campus and the facilities, and just the great, just the great people working. There. I was like, man, this is a, this is a special place. And I can see, I can see why this place would fit him. I mean, even though he's from, he's from Southern California, he's not really like a. He kind of enjoys kind of being alone and kind of being like away from it all. So I can, I can totally see that environment fitting him like a glove. Do you remember when he came back from his first visit? He went to Alabama, then Georgia, and then Clemson. Do you, do you yeah. what what what's your what are your most vivid sort of recollections of? Well, I asked him. I asked him at that point, like, you know, you, you basically you basically saw the three schools that you're going to go to. Like, you saw you saw the three ones that you're going to consider. Like, which one is it? And he, he didn't say it, but yeah, you know, I mean, just from his reaction of how he was describing every one of those the, the three visits. Um, it, it was the uh, the things he was talking about and the way he was talking about it, you can just tell like it, it left a, a lasting impression like he was blown away by the facilities and meeting Saban and whatnot from you know his Alabama visit and um, you know he said some high things about Georgia but he, when he talked about like the faith aspect of, of Clemson and just the, the the type of people that are around the facility and uh, that part of it I, I was like oh wow this is that that, that definitely uh, cause, that definitely left a lasting impression. Can we go back to when you first met him? When you were on your interview, what what was the what was that conversation like? What what exactly did y'all talk about? And I'm not, not nothing really um, too in depth. I just want to get to know him a little bit more. And kind of talked about. I mean, he's asked him where he grew up, and you know, talked about kind of conversational things. Just kind of getting to know him a little bit more, and you know, asked about a family, asked about you know, asked about what his favorite football player was. <laughs> So, um, so things like that that were, were pretty. Just, just got to just try to start a conversation and get to know a bit more. But um, the, the football play was funny because you know he, he definitely talked about you know verticals and throwing throwing deep balls is definitely his favorite thing to do, and uh, he did not disappoint. <laughs> uh, so you asked him what his favorite play was, and he said deep balls. Four verticals. <laughs> four verticals is his favorite play. Anytime I meet a quarterback in four verticals is a favorite play. Uh, I'm a big fan of that quarterback, so <laughs> he did not shy away from throwing that deep ball. I remember there was a time, uh, even during spring ball, we were working on a bunch of like shorter stuff and uh, just stuff that was kind of more timing passes and kind of things to complete our offense a little bit more. And he, 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 just very respectfully, he pulled me aside. I was like, Coach, I just want to throw fades. <laughs> so <I'm throwing> deep <laughs> ball. I'm like, I know you do, man. I just got to try to work on this other stuff, too. Just in case everyone's like literally bailing out of the stadium one day. <laughs> we might need to throw something underneath, but uh, he got a nice little laugh out of that, and uh, it was pretty funny. But uh, I definitely, I definitely remember that that comment because all yeah, anytime we got into trouble, it was like we're going to get shot. He was most likely going to connect usually. 
so what was it from that first conversation that, that totally blew you away, like that made you walk away going, wow, this kid is just different between the ears? Just his awareness of um, of others. I mean, that was really uh, apparent just as he was talking about his family and talking about um, the things that were important to him. Uh, I think, um, you know, none of it was uh, none of it was ego driven. None of it was self centered. It was all based off of you know how important you know his family was to him, his faith was to him. That was the stuff that was like most high school kids aren't talking about this. Like, you know, like most people would be embarrassed to hug their uh, hug their mom and in front of you know all your friends and stuff in high school. And, you know, not him. Like. He, he, Come on in, mama. <laughs> like stuff like that. That's just you know, just is, is, is um, that, that that part of it showed, just showed me how grounded he was and, and how how much family meant to him, how close he was to his family. And that that was that was definitely apparent from the first conversation I had with him. All right, great stuff from Stephen Lowe and also Dustin Limlin, two guys very much in DJ's corner, very capable, of course. I've given some really cool insight as we learn more about Clemson's new starting quarterback. Thanks to our very loyal sponsors for being a part of the podcast. Most of all, thanks to all of you for making it a part of your listening routine. Cheers. Cheers.